So yes, this is my last session. You get to open and close with me. You're stuck with me the whole time. Um, so this piece, I'm going. I, I saved the the most mathematical bit for the last when everybody's hungover and, and tired and burned out. So um, yeah, I'm going to talk about well one particular project which involves a bunch of fun lattice math. So this project is just done in collaboration with a large number of people who are listed up here and. What we did in this project, we started looking at um, this neat public key infrastructure that Taiwan has. So they have um, these smart cards. Uh, everybody in Taiwan can get a smart card, and it allows them to securely log into all sorts of government services. Um, you can file your income taxes and so on and so forth with this neat PKI smart card. Um, and so these smart cards. They are issued by the government. They have all of the proper certifications for smart card security, so on and so forth. Um, they have, they use RSA for their PKI. You can encrypt and you can sign <coughs> these cards. Um, the, the RSA keys are generated on the cards and then they are uploaded to a publicly accessible or used to be publicly accessible LDAP directory um, so that um, other people could verify signatures and so on and so forth. That's picture you have in your head of this infrastructure. So here's a sample certificate belonging to um, Chen Chang, who is one of the co-authors of this, Doug Chang. Um, so you can see it's a totally normal certificate, public key. Um, it has personally identifying information on it, so on and so forth. Okay. So a nice student project, which was started by some students in Taiwan, um, in April 2012, they scraped the LDAPs, the publicly accessible LDAP server, downloaded all of the certificates, which was about 3 million of them, um, and got about 2.3 million 1024-bit RSA keys and um, over 700,000 2048-bit RSA keys. So uh, the government stopped issue issuing 1024-bit keys in, in 2010 and, and upgraded to 2048-bit keys. And then, so um, after downloading all of these keys, they ran the GCD algorithm that I told you about in the previous lecture on all of these RC, uh, RSA keys. And 100 of three, 103 of them were factored using this algorithm. <coughs> and they reported this in a conference in Taiwan um, under the title Cryptanalysis in Real Life. And they wrote a report that some of the keys were factored and informed the Ministry of Interior in Taiwan. Okay. And the Ministry of Interior promised to, or Ministry of Information, I think, promised to replace cards of affected users. Okay. So an interesting application of the stuff that I talked about last time in a new scenario, which is not you know, these kinds of software vulnerabilities that I was telling you about, but actually some smart card hardware. Okay. Um, actually, I should say, um, about six months later, I and several of the other authors, um, co-authors on the ultimate <coughs> of this, found out about this and said, that's interesting. Can we see the factors? And so they sent us the, the keys and we took a look at them. And when we looked at the most commonly repeated factor, um, this is what it was, which is not just not random, it's really, really, really not random. <laughs> uh, and actually, this is the um, next prime after 2 to the 511 plus 2 to the 510. So the top two bits are set to 1 and then increment to the next prime. Uh, the next most repeated common factor after that was this number here, which is also pretty not random looking. Um, and many of the other most repeated factors repeated similar kinds of patterns to this. So this raises a much more interesting question of what exactly is going on with these cards that is, that is causing this issue. So here is the bit pattern from this previous um, thing in, in hex here, which is transformed to bits. And you can see that it's, um, it looks sort of periodic, but not entirely periodic, right? You have zero, 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 and then you have like three zero, four zeros in a row and some more zeros, and then it's actually like not an even the same number of zeros until you get three zeros, and so on and so forth. 
So it's sort of periodic, but not quite periodic. And in fact, if you swap every 16 bits of every 32, and then realign, <laughs> then it becomes periodic. And <coughs> when we did this to the um, actual, many of the, the factors that we found, we found period, uh, patterns of period 1, 3, 5, and 7. So there's something more going on here. And so then we hypothesized that many of, yep? Yeah? Are those blue bar? Hmm? In the previous slide, there was a blue bar? Ah, this is the bit that was um, at the, this is the least significant part that's not, uh, the, the part that's incremented to the, to the next prime, so it's not going to be part of the periodic pattern. Yeah. So this breaks the periodic pattern because it's the part that got incre incremented at the next part, but apart from that, this is totally periodic. And the, the most significant <coughs> So at this point, we hypothesized that there were repeated factors of the form choose a bit pattern of small prime length and repeat it to cover 512 bits. All of the factor um, RSA keys had 1024-bit uh, keys, or 1024-bit moduli. Um, then, OK, so for each 32-bit word, swap the 16-bit um, the words inside of it. Um, <coughs> clamp the top two bits to one, and then increment to next prime. So this suggests a new factoring algorithm, which is generate everything else of this form that we haven't seen, and just do trial division. And we did that, and enumerating all these patterns, we were able to factor 18 more keys, and extending to patterns of length nine, on the theory that maybe these primes are interacting with each other somehow, um, gave us four more keys. That was fun. This is the part of, of search analysis that's like the fun bit where you're like sort of playing with systems. Did they screw this up? Yes, they did. Okay. Um, okay. But this didn't actually explain all of the prime factors that we saw. So we saw some things like this. Um, these have more bits. This is not. These are not the same least significant bits as we saw in the previous one. So these have some other bit set to, to one down here, and then they were incremented to the next prime. So um, one could hypothesize that maybe there was some kind of sporadic process in the whatever generating process that was generating all zeros, or 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, whatever, that at some point would cause some other sporadic one bit, and then you would get a, a different set of least significant bits when you increment it to the next prime. So is it possible to find factor more keys of this form? That is the question that we will ask in the, in the course of this talk. So we hypothesize that there are more keys that look like this. So we set the two, top two bits to zero, or top two bits to one, and then fill out, in this case, a pattern of all zeros, but maybe we could fill out some other pattern and <coughs> some unknownly significant bits. <coughs> Now I'm going to do a long interlude, and the long interlude is going to be about lattices. Uh, but in order to get there, uh, we will take a little walk. So here is an example of toy textbook RSA. Um, so I'm just, I take some message here. It's just an ASCII text. I, I'm doing base 35 just to transform it into an integer in some way. So, so this thing gets transformed in, into some um, integer in some reasonable way. Then I do um, textbook RSA encryption with exponent 3, um, raise my message to bot in. Does anybody see a problem with this? <laughs> anybody? No it's low exponent, but, but RSA is still secure if you use exponent three as far as you know. The message is rather small. It is, it is pretty small. Um, so you can just take the cube root of the ciphertext and retrieve the original message again. Because if this message was not long enough to actually wrap around with the modulus. So I generated a 1024-bit modulus. This thing is much less than um, 
1024 bits, or uh, 300 bits. So this is, this is one of the reasons why we use padding in RSA, is so you don't end up with problems like this. But there are, there are more interesting reasons why we use padding. Um, so here's another example. So ignore the fact that this RSA modulus is really small, like small enough that I could factor it on my laptop, because I'm just doing this so that I can show you a, a non-trivial example that fits on the screen. So unlike Antoine, I'm not doing like live sage, but pretend that this is live sage because I totally just copy pasted these, except for the ones that I did typos in out of a sage session. Okay, so I generate an RSA key, and I'm totally not even saving the, the private key here. So I have a, a modulus n. I have a message, which is some thing, which you'll have to believe me, but this is long enough that um, this won't have the not even wrapping around encryption problem. Then I encrypt it with um, exponent 3 and, uh, and modulus n. Then I get my separate text. So I can check whether the trivial thing works, and it doesn't because I have actually wrapped around. But this is an example of a message where we might be able to guess some of the message, maybe. Um, so what if, uh, what if the attacker knew that um, most of the message said the password for today is and then had you know, some unknown thing at the end? So here is our guess at what, what our attacker's guess at what the message might be. The password for today is and some, some string of, of things. Um, then, we do the following. I create a parameter x, which you don't have to care very much, but the, the idea is that it's just this, about the size of the thing that I'm looking for, which is this word here. Um, and then I create a matrix. And I, I couldn't actually fit the construction of the matrix in here. I apologize. But, um, but the matrix is, I wrote it there, but I'll write it here. Um, so I have a, a polynomial f of x equals um, c minus uh, plus c minus a plus x cubed. So this is um, if we have f of oh the black marker. Yes. Okay. C minus a plus x cubed. So if we plug in, um, I'm going to get the signs wrong, but basically f of uh, basically if we plug in the difference between our, our ciphertext and our guess, then we should get um, this should be zero. Did I get my signs correct? Does that make sense? Did I lose everybody already? Everybody looks confused. What are the um, A A is um, the thing that I know. So I, I know that um, Call this R. So A plus R Q is equal to C mod N. I know that. So I just move this over and then I get um, that when I when I plug in here, this this should be equal to zero. So this is just a, a polynomial that happens to to vanish at this thing that I'm looking for. That makes more sense? Did I unlose some people? Okay. So I have this polynomial, and I have, um, I have n. And so I know this polynomial vanishes 
at the thing that I'm looking for, mod n. And what I want to do is I want to construct a new polynomial using some magic that will um, vanish not just mod n, but over the integers at this thing that I'm looking for. And so I have two pieces of information. I have f and I have n. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, construct some integer linear combination of these things that I know and make, make my new polynomial out of it. So what I'm doing is I have, um, if I just start with, let's see, let's say f is, this is monic, so it's x cubed plus f2 x squared plus f1 x plus f0. These are just, I've expanded this out, these are the coefficients. Um, so if I take my polynomial f x, um, C uh, is, so F0 is C minus A cubed. This is totally stupid expansion. Um, okay, so I know that this evaluated at R is 0 mod N. I know that um, N is 0 mod N. I know that um, n times x, if I evaluate this at anything, it's still 0 mod n. Um, uh, I know the polynomial n times x squared, if I evaluate at anything, it's still 0 mod n. Nothing fancy is happening here. But what I can try to do now is that I can hope that if I take some um, integer combination of these things, where I've managed to somehow find um, some combination that makes this coefficient small and this coefficient small and this coefficient small. Then when I evaluate, so this will be some new polynomial Q of X. Um, and my hope is that when I evaluate, um, so I know by construction, so Q of X is equal to So if I can bound these small coefficients here so that I know that they achieve this property, then I know that I've discovered a polynomial that will have a root, which is the thing that I'm looking for. So here I'm just, um, this capital X here is just a bound on the size of the root here. So I actually have Q of X is less than or equal to the sum of QI X. I am, I'm going to try to hope that that's less than n. So unfortunately, it doesn't work to just do this. What I'm doing is taking slightly higher powers of, of n. Um, so I have n squared, n squared times x, n squared times x squared, n times f of x. And then I go up um, n times f of x times x. The, so there's a small x and a big x. This is an annoying scaling factor. Um, that I put in here. So the annoying scaling factor is because I want, um, what I'm actually going to do is create a matrix of coefficient vectors. So this is the coefficient vector of um, x cubed and this is one of those annoying things. I don't know how to explain this in a clean way. Um, but 
basically what I want is for the L1 norm of um, of a vector in this lattice to be this um, uh, <coughs> this bound here that we're trying to do. So you can see that um, if if my if my vector <coughs> here is is like um, this will be some q. <coughs> I take some arbitrary vector here, I get like Q3 capital X to the 3, Q2 capital X to the 2, Q1 capital X, Q0, that'll be exactly this sum here. And so then I can divide out by the relevant powers of X, plug in um, the variable X, I get a polynomial back again, I find the roots of the pol that polynomial, and then I'm done. How many people have I totally lost? I'm going to finish this example and then I'll like redo this again. So, the the magic here is I have constructed this matrix, which looks like this, only bigger. I call LLL on it, which I'm totally using as a black box. I call this magic function. I create a polynomial out of um, the coefficients of the first vector in the output of this function. Um, multiply them by, I, so I, I divide out by the powers of x, I put in this variable x, and then I factor this polynomial that I, this magic polynomial that I just constructed, and I get some root, and it just so happens that when I um, plug in a minus my root, I get out the thing that I was looking I'll go over this again. Um, so what I'm actually doing here is using Popper's Smith's method. Um, so he usually says it's with a D, but since I'm doing say I'll call this an E. Um, so Copper Smith's theorem from 1996, um, he says that we can efficiently compute up to a one over E fraction of the bits of an RSA encrypted message with public exponent E if we know the rest of the plain text. So the picture is much like this one, where no, um, we have some message here, and there's, say, like, it doesn't have to be the least significant bits, but this is a 1 over e fraction of the message, and this has the same length as n. So if you, if you know, all of this bit, then you can compute this part in polynomial time. So that's what his theorem says. Um, and this is a special case of um, this theorem, which is given a polynomial f of degree d and some modulus n, um, which is unspecified, we can efficiently find all of the roots um, which vanish on it in polynomial time. So. This is the same equation as before, so we have, um, if we know most of the message, then we get some value where we just have to add on a little, a little piece and then, and then we get the whole rest of the message. So this is our sort of RSA with bad padding decryption polynomial. Everybody's still lost. Yeah. So um, why is this interesting? I'll tell you why this is interesting. The next slide has the algorithm, I'll go over it again. Um, so this is interesting because um, in the general case, if there weren't any bounds on the size of the root that we were finding, then being able to solve, to, to compute um, roots of polynomials mod arbitrary n um, is equivalent to breaking RSA. So the RSA encryption function is you take your message, you raise it to the eth power, and you get some ciphertext. So if you move the ciphertext c over to the other side of the equation, then recovering the message from the ciphertext is equivalent to finding a root of this polynomial. And so, of course, by, by normal RSA decryption, we know that there is an algorithm to solve this equation, um, which is that you can factor n into its prime factors, p and q. Then you solve this equation mod p and mod q, and you use the Chinese remainder theorem to, um, to lift it to, um, to your solution mod n. <coughs> and so this relies on us being able to solve equations mod primes, which you can do efficiently, polynomial time. 
Um, so what Coppersmith's theorem on the previous slide is doing is it's giving us another way um, of being able to solve equations in, under some conditions. So if we know that there is a solution, which happens to be small, which is, if you take a random equation, it's unlikely to have a, a small solution. But if we have a specially constructed equation that has a small solution, then we can find it in polynomial time. <laughs> This part clear? Good. You're convinced of the importance of this of this theorem. Okay, so um, I'm gonna repeat this. Um, and I'm just gonna do it for single power. So I have, I have an input, um, so I have my input polynomial, and I have an n, and I want to find a root of f on it. Okay. Um, so the simple thing that I was trying to do before is saying that if, um, <coughs> say, r less than x, we have an upper bound, which maybe I'll draw a little feet here. So this capital X is our upper bound on the size of our root that we're finding, on the absolute value. So I know that, um, so fact number one, f of r is equal to zero mod n by definition from the input of our equation. Then um, we also have that um, if we have some, uh, so we're going to construct some q of x, which is the sum of, say, So if we, if we construct some new polynomial q, which is some integer multiple of f of x plus some integers times n times x to the i, um, then uh, q of r is still equal to 0 mod n by construction, because we're taking something that's 0 mod n and adding multiples of n to it, still 0 mod n. Then um, if we have uh, Q of R is strictly less than M, then Q of R is equal to zero over the integers. So this is this is the lemma we want to show. So then what we want to do here is we're going to say um, Q of R is bounded by um, sum of qi x uh, <coughs> so q of r is equal to sum of qi r to the i <coughs> which is bounded by absolute value which is bounded by So if we show that this is strictly less than n, then we're done. So in order to construct the lattice, um, what we're going to do in the lattice is we're going to have, the lattice con consists of the coefficient vectors of these things. So this will be basically um, uh, 
polynomial here is a coefficient vector q d minus 1 x to the d minus 1. Does that make sense? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Just to make sure I'm following. So, what? Basically, your, your initial polynomial plus these uh, additional ones for the lattice. Yes. And you want to construct a, a polynomial out of those with small coefficients. Yes. And that basically means reducing inside the lattice. Yes. Using other ones. Yes. Yes. So we just construct a lattice out of the coefficient vectors of, um, of our input polynomials here. Run LOL. Get some short vector out of that. And that's the, the coefficient vector of the polynomial we're looking for. Sure. Maybe I can add one comment. The, the, the x factor you are adding in when you construct the lattice is there to make sure that at the polynomial you get at the end, all the monomials, when you evaluate them at the root, are going to contribute roughly with the same size to the total value. And it helps to find something which is doesn't have this one. The scaling coefficient bigger. <coughs> that part's kind of annoying. How many people are still totally lost? How many people are afraid to raise their hands? <laughs> <laughs> How many people are looking at their cell phones? All right. Should I move on? So it's kind of. I'm, I'm still waving my hands a little bit <laughs> furiously. Okay. Um, so the only fact that we need to know about lattices is that. So a lattice is a set of points in Rn that is generated by integer, co integer combinations of a set of basis vectors. Um, so we have a, here we have a dimension n space, we have n basis vectors, we take all integer combinations, they form a discrete subset of space. Um, the only fact that we need, which we will use as a black box, is that um, in polynomial time we can find a vector of um, I'm being sloppy about the approximation factors here, but um, if we compute the determinant of the basis matrix and we raise that to the 1 over <coughs> power, and then there's a exponential approximation factor here. So, but this totally doesn't matter for everything that I'm going to tell you about today, so this is the only part that matters. So if we compute the determinant of this matrix and take it to the 1 over dimension power, then um, that says the size of the vector that we can find. Um, so, I'm not going to explain any more about LLL, just treat it as a, a magic function. So in practice, LLL does quite well and everything that I'm doing has very small dimensions, so we, can we just pretend that the approximation factor doesn't exist. Um, there's an open question of why LLL performs better than the, um, the theoretical guarantees seem to um, say on randomly chosen lattices. Um, and we're being clever about the way that we're constructing our lattice so that we have a really easy time of computing the determinant. Um, <coughs> so just to compute, I'll do this again even though it's kind of painful. So if I have, um, if I have my lattice here, <coughs> I had something that looked like this, and then that was my simplest, stupidest lattice. So if I take this thing and I compute the determinant, um, which is just because this is an upper triangular uh, matrix, the determinant is just the product of the things in the diagonal. So I have an x to the 6 and I have an n squared. And then the dimension is 4. So the, we know that we can find some vector which is about x to the 6 and squared to the 1 fourth. And by this thing here, if this is less than n, then we get a theorem. So if I try to solve this, I get x 6 n squared is less than uh, 
and the four. So x six is less than n squared. So if x is less than this is wrong. This would be n, what did I do n cubed, not an n x squared. Cubed. In the first line of the the, 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 the determinant is x to the six n cubed, right? N cubed. Yes. You're Assuming that all of my arithmetic is correct now. So this says that we should be able to find roots of size about um, n to the 1 sixth. So we have something non-trivial already. So all that's happening for, but this is, we only have a, a cubic polynomial here. So what's happening in um, what Coppersmith is doing that, well, this is actually, I guess, Hungary, Graham, and Alexander May were the ones who phrased it in this way. If you take higher powers of n here, so instead of just n to the 1 here, we have higher powers of n, and we fill out this much larger lattice, um, and we have also extra powers of f and, and x beyond, beyond here, then you can get a better ratio of determinant to dimension, and you can get this down to x less than n to the 1 third. So that's what's going on. But this is, our, this is our stupid little calculation that we can do if we want to be really cheap and fast and only run LLL on a degree four or a dimension four lattice, then we can at least do pretty well, which is good enough. Is that people are kind of cool with what's going on? Good, happy, yes. Okay, so here's another magic trick. We have time for all my magic tricks. Um, so here I have another RSA modulus, which I'm constructing. I have P and Q are 512 bit primes. I have N, which is P times mu. And then I take this value A, which I'm erasing the 86 least significant bits of P. Um, so if I look at if I look at A in hexadecimal, <coughs> the, the last 86 bits of, of P are all zeros. So I've erased those. Now, we're getting closer to the problem that I said we wanted to solve, which is that um, if somebody handed you this value, an n, and said, can you get me p from this, almost all of p, but <coughs> except for 86 bits, which is too much to group force, and n, can you do it? And the answer is yes. This is actually a, a prettier matrix than before. So I can write, instead of, um, so I can write a new equation, which is, let's see, um, I like to reuse single, uh, single letter variables here. So I've got, um, a plus x is my equation, um, and I know that um, I've set this up so that A plus some thing, which is relatively small, is equal to P, and P divides N. So I don't know what P is, but I do know that P divides N, and N is public. So I'm constructing a lattice again, and the lattice um, consists of the entries of um, f of x squared, which is um, x squared <coughs> x plus a squared, which is x squared plus 2ax plus a squared, and um, f of x, which is x plus a, and n, which is n. So you can see that this is just the coefficient vectors of these, um, these three polynomials scaled with my magic factor of capital X again. And then I run LLL on it. And then I take the coefficient vectors of 
I take the coefficients that I get out again, I scale them by x, I make this polynomial again with just the coefficients of the, the shortest vector. Um, I factor this thing, I get some value. When I add that to a, I get p. So this magic construction has given me um, this 86-bit missing value. <coughs> super efficiently, a fraction of a second. So this is almost exactly the same theorem as above, except that I've changed it from vanishing mod n to vanishing mod some divisor of n. And the, we have some, some size of this divisor, but all we need to know is that it's bigger than, um, than n to the something. So in this case, p is, say, square root of n. So the beta in this theorem is, is 1 half. So this theorem says that um, if we should be able to, to find roots vanishing mod any divisor, um, like if there exists a root that vanishes mod a divisor of n that satisfies this property, we can find it in polynomial time. So in this case, the degree of our equation is 1, and beta is 1 half. So we should be able to find um, a missing root of size n to the one fourth, or about half of the bits of p. I did much less than <coughs> half of the bits of p, but yeah, that was because I wanted a, a small lattice. Does that make sense? Good. Um, should I work this out for, for this particular example? Would that be useful or people happy? You know, work it out. Um, so the, the, the part of the theorem that I want, so I'm, I'm again constructing some q of x. Um, so I have q of x, which will be an integer combination of these three polynomials. Um, and I want q of r is 0 mod p. And I don't know what p is, but I do know that um, p is P is bigger than n to the beta. So if I have, if I can do this absolute value thing again. Um, so if if I can I can bound this as before, and this is strictly less than say n to the beta, which is less than p. Then since I know that my polynomial here is vanishing mod p and it's strictly less than p, even though I don't know what p is, then I know that this is identically zero. And so that r will be a root of this polynomial. So um, for this particular lattice, um, the construction is something like um, I have an x squared, a 2ax, and an a squared. Then I have an x, an a, and an n. So the determinant is x cubed n, and, and the dimension is 3. So if I have x cubed n to the 1 third should be less than n to the 1 half. So x cubed is less than n to the 3 halves, and so x cubed is less than n to the 1 half, so x is less than n to the 1 sixth in this case. So that's why I chose a fairly small number of bits of, of x on the, in the example that I did. Does that make sense? So there's a bunch of variants of this that are all kind of amusing. You can take basically any representation of an RSA private key, and, and for some relatively small kind of impressive fraction of the bits, you can recover the key in polynomial. <coughs> and they all basically use variants of, of this theorem. What is the implication for the bit on that? 
Um, these are used. These values are used in um, Chinese remainder theorem computations oh. for speeding up RSA. So, um, if you're doing, I don't know if there's a, I don't think there's a real motivation for any of these, but if, you can imagine if you're doing some kind of side channel attack that if you get, you know, half of the bits, but then your signal cuts out for the other half of the bits, then you can recover the rest of the game. Yeah. Have you also intermediate thing? Half of the bits of D, a quarter of the bits of D, can I take two knobs and then <coughs> an eighth of the bits of D and, and a little less, and a half minus something of the bits of D? In some cases, yeah. Um, in some cases, it doesn't help. Like, for low public exponent RSA, it doesn't help to have like the most significant bits you would like listen to significant bits of, of D. It's a little bit funny. But you can, you can in some cases, write equations and move them, move the bits of, of one thing that you know around to another one, usually using low public exponent RSA. I don't think anybody's worked out all of the cases, though. But if you go to these papers and look at the things that have cited them, you can get basically everything that's been done in this area. Um, <coughs> uh, what I was saying before is, um, well, I guess this is kind of Claudio's question, is like, how is this a natural attack to get like, <coughs> this much of, a, of, of somebody's key? Um, you can imagine cases where it happened, but they seemed a little bit artificial. Um, so if I go back to the case of the Taiwanese um, factored keys that we were finding, um, we were, so we were observing the random number generator kind of getting stuck in these repeated patterns. And if the random number generator got unstuck in the least significant bits, then we could try to recover um, keys that have this form. Um, so this was the, this was this example that I just run out. So this suggests that perhaps we could imagine that um, this value A that we know is say one one and then all zeros. And then this thing that we're looking for is anything that happened in the least significant n to the one sixth bits of uh, P or Q, it doesn't matter. Um, so what we did was we took this small stupid three dimensional lattice, put in the pattern A equals one one and then 510 zeros um, and then just ran LLL putting n equals the mo every modulus in the data set here. And we got some polynomial out of the smallest vector here. Tried, fa tried to factor it. If um, it factored and had um, some groups that if we added it to A, factored n, then, then we were golden. Totally stupid thing to do. Um, and we did this with every, every, all of the patterns we had generated, and this factored 39 new keys. Um, and all but two of the keys that we'd factored with GCD. So, yeah? Did you try to look why these two keys were not uh, factored? In missing ones, what was? They had bits in other places. Okay, so they had uh, bits unstuck at the beginning instead of the end. Yeah. Okay. So here's, a, here's another fun magic trick you can play with RSA and key recovery. Um, so here I'm generating a 1024-bit RSA modulus again. Um, and here I'm generating my de RSA decryption exponent is, it doesn't matter that it's prime. Um, that was just to make it easy. Um, but, but my decryption exponent has size n to the 1 fourth. So D is small, but it's not so small that it would be easy to, to brute force. So imagine, I mean, pretend I didn't do a 1024-bit um, key. Imagine I had a much bigger key so that D still had a reasonable size, and I can expect this problem to be hard. Um, then I, I you know, take E well-defined as um, D inverse mod P minus 1, Q minus 1. This might seem like a kind of reasonable thing to do if you want to speed up the decryption or signing process for, for RSA to make the, um, the person doing the verification to, they would have to do a much longer exponentiation and the person doing the, the signing or the decryption would only have to do an exponentiation worth one quarter of the bits. So 
I'm going to do something very similar, except that instead of having a univariate equation, I have a bivariate equation. I'll do it again. Okay. This is this is a this is a different attack. Okay. Okay. I guess that's confusing. Okay. Um, so I have I have a new equation. So I can write down e times d is one mod p minus one q minus one. So this is the sort of RSA equation. Um, and if I replace um, the modular reduction with some explicit k times p minus 1, q minus 1. So this is just whatever explicit integer is, is happening here in the modular reduction. Now <coughs> I'm going to expand this out. n minus p plus q plus 1 is e times d. And I'm going to rename this to be s just to make my life easier. So p plus q is some unknown value s. And we actually know that s is about n to the 1 half. I mean, it's like 3 times n to the 1 half or so. Because um, each of the and q is n to the 1 half. We also know that um, k here is something like um, n to the one fourth, um, because we have d is n to the one fourth and e is about size n. <coughs> so I can, and we know what n is, we know what one is, we know what one is, um, and we know what e is also. So those are the public things of this parts of this equation. So we can write, um, call this. So we have two unknowns, k and s, um, and d. <coughs> so we know that um, well, uh, so we know that this thing is equal to zero mod e. Also, so if we write some new equation which is, call this x is, so x um, is k and y is s. So we have a new, we're going to construct a new polynomial. Um, so we have f of x, y is y plus x times n plus 1 minus xy. So we know that if we plug in k, so k and s are roots of this thing long e, just by the way that we've constructed it. <coughs> and so what I'm doing here is I'm constructing a new lattice which consists of the coefficient vectors of this polynomial here. So I've switched the signs there. <coughs> so the the lattice we have f of x y, and then there's um, e times x and e are polynomials, and I've filled out. This is the lattice that I've just constructed here. Um, so I run LLL on this lattice basis. I find a vector which is less than um, uh, <coughs> determinant to the one or dimension. So I have like, uh, <coughs> I ran out of space to write this. Um, so the determinant is x squared y e squared, and the dimension is 3. 
So, um, and we're asking for this to be zero mod e. So we have x squared y e squared to the one third is less than e. So x squared y is less than, so I have an e cubed divided by e squared is less than e. So we should be able to, um, <coughs> we know that this thing vanishes over the integers at s and k if s and k satisfy these bounds here. So I run LLL and I magically get out. This is even more of a magic trick because I can't explain it. I know there's a, a good answer, but um, it so happens that we get a very special polynomial that happens to have the coefficients um, of the polynomial B, um, S, and K. So this is K, um, E times D minus one divided by B of N, yeah. Nadia, maybe I don't know if you are aware of that, but in this case where the, the D is smaller than the uh, that fourth root of it, uh, you can use the linear continued fraction attack. Yeah, so you, you can do the continued fraction. Which only the latest reduction in dimension 2 in fact, yeah. 3. And, and the fact that you obtain something very special might really be linked to that. I, I'm sure. So, so the normal way that this is, is phrased is with continued fractions. I'm trying to do it in lattices just to have an example of lattices because you can generalize this to yeah. higher dimensions and then you get non-trivial things, which I'm about to do. So yes, the correct way to do this is with continued fractions. <coughs> Everything you do with continued fractions, you can also do with a two by two lattice. Yeah. So there's a special two by two lattice going on here. So um, we have magically found K and we've also magically found S here. And so then we can reconstruct D by taking this equation and plugging in KS. So, magic, sort of. Um, but the thing, the thing is what I wanted to do here is I take a lattice, I find, I have a multivariate, um, I construct a multivariate equation, I can still do this with multivariate equations and I just find more than one. This one happened to have a special <coughs> form of the solution. Um, in general, you're not guaranteed to have this. So, uh, Wiener's original theorem where he used continued fractions um, you can do this when d is less than n to the one fourth. Um, this was improved by Bonet and Durfee, who used lattices, and they did the same trick as before, um, plus an extra trick. So you take this, you take these equations, and you raise them to higher multiplicity, and you take more multiples of x and y. But they looked very carefully at the structure of this lattice and found that there was a sublattice that you could find that would give you a better ratio of determinant to dimension. So they could find a slightly better vector which gave them a slightly better result here and to the 0.292 rather than 0.24, um, So, but they're basically doing this. So the, the advantage of looking at this as a lattice is you can then generalize to the, these higher multiplicity tricks. So the, um, the reason I did this the lattice-based way and not the uh, continued fraction way is because um, there's kind of a general formula here, which is poorly understood by all of us, I think, um, but which works pretty well in practice, which is that if you're given some multivariate polynomial um, and you want to find roots mod n or not mod n, it doesn't matter so much, um, then you can try to do something like this. So you construct a lattice like this, you construct a lattice like this with higher multiplicities, managing mod higher degrees of of E, there's a disgusting uh, a pro optimization problem in here and figuring out what the best power of E that you want to vanish here it is and what the best power of, um, of your polynomial that you want to go up to. Um, but you can believe me that you can do it. Um, and this is exactly the same as everything that I showed you in the integrated case, except that we don't uh, totally understand what's going on. But in general, what you might hope would happen is that um, you reduce this lattice, you take the shortest vector, you get some, maybe I should call this Q1, um, you get some multivariate polynomial that you know van uh, vanishes mod your roots, you get another one um, from the second shortest vector, and so on and so forth, and you hope that these generate some finite set of solutions, which you can <coughs> solve for using variable elimination, resultants, Grobner bases, something like that. So this is a general formula. 
Um, but these results are sort of ad hoc, but they work. And there's a bunch of applications when they work. Um, so the reason that this is useful in the Taiwanese keys case, of course, is if you have, um, these are some other factors of keys that we have um, that have, uh, say, things that are unpredictable in the most significant bits and the least significant bits, or maybe most significant bits somewhere in the middle and then least significant bits, but almost all of the bits are predictable. <coughs> so we might try to generalize this to two or even more variables where you say, I don't know what the most significant bits are and I don't know what the least significant bits are, but I know everything in the middle. So I write some equation that looks something like this, so I have the piece that I know, and then I have the one piece that I don't know which I've shifted over, so this is say the most significant bits, and then T is like some offset of the bit location, and then I have the least significant bits, and I ask this to vanish mod P. And we ran this on the 20 most common factors and factored 30 more, 13 more keys. So doing things that are totally stupid, but they're still working. So um, this is what I outlined of what you expect the heuristic algorithm to look like um, in the multivariate case. So I have my equation that I want to vanish mod p with my unknowns, and I generate some lattice um, with multiples of f, and I run LLL, and I take the two smallest polynomials, and I try to find the solution of the system of equations that is generated by the polynomial, those two polynomials. And I check if um, the solutions that I get actually um, produce p. Um, so if you do this kind of analysis, it says that a 10-dimensional lattice should work to solve for um, the size of the piece, the most significant bits, the least significant bits, is less than about n to the 110. And so this means that we should have, say, for 1024-bit keys, which is what, what we had, um, we should have R1 and R2 less than 2 to the 102. So we can divide that up however we like. We can take R1 to be 50 bits and R2 to be 50 bits, or R1 to be 10 bits and R2 to be 90 bits, whatever you like. Um, so there's some tricky details in here, which didn't come up in the example that I, I showed you, <coughs> because we only got one equation. So if we, if we need two equations, um, then do we actually know that we get a sensible system of polynomials that has a finite number of solutions? Um, so we know because this is a basis for lattice and that we are, um, it is still a basis for lattice after we run LOL, that we get linearly independent vectors here, which means that the coefficient vectors of our polynomials are linearly independent. But that doesn't mean that the polynomials themselves don't have some kind of algebraic dependency, which would give us an infinite family of solutions. Um, so there's an assumption that exists in almost all of the multivariate coppersmith type papers that says, even though we generate this big lattice out of um, a multivariate set of equations, and we and then we pull out the polynomials corresponding to the shortest vectors of some lattice loop that we've constructed in an arbitrary manner, um, that when we pull out these polynomials, they generate a sensible system of polynomials that has a finite number of solutions that we can find. Um, and that's that the short vectors of the LLL reduced basis that we constructed correspond to algebraically independent polynomials. And this failed in our experiments. So most papers report that it succeeded. For us, it failed. Um, and in fact, in most cases, the polynomial shared some kind of linear common factor of this form. And that was the piece that actually vanished at the roots that we were looking for. So we only had one equation here. And um, it was, but fortunately, it turned out to be a magical equation like this one. And so we could still find the solutions by searching for the smallest satisfying solution um, to this equation which is kind of like doing an extra lattice basis reduction. Um, so this is only through like by hand experimenting. I don't have any sensible explanation of what's going on here. So this is an open problem for you guys, if you think this is interesting, of what is going on here and what am I missing? Thanks, Jordan. Uh, so 
Because I haven't seen anything to. There's a few cases where people have special ad hoc solutions of this form. So they say that you get one, um, you get one equation, and then you can construct a new lattice of things that you have, by construction are algebraically independent from the previous one, and you iterate that way. That's kind of the way that people proceed. But if you only want to do one LLL computation, then, then you're stuck. That's the best that I know how to do. So, um, okay. so there was some other weirdness going on, which is that um, in doing uh, this sort of calculation by figuring out what the determinant of our lattice should be um, and what the dimension is. So like every time you increase, every time you take a higher multiple of, of your polynomial here, um, you increase the number of <coughs> polynomial terms, and so you increase the dimension that your lattice needs to have. Um, so the sort of back of the envelope analysis said that the algorithm should work with lattice dimension at least 10, um, but in practice lattice dimension 6 works. Um, I don't know why. Um, lattice dimension 6 says that the size of the root is 0, um, if you calculate out the bounds. Um, and it's also the case, but lattice dimension three did not work, so this didn't work. Uh, it was also the case that um, there's a sort of magical relation with the fact that um, <coughs> these patterns had were repeating with particular periods. That um, this construction was finding patterns even when we didn't specify the same pattern. So it was finding different patterns, like different different A's. Magic. I don't know why. Um, so here's a few of the experiments that we ran, which are, we ran things until we got bored and decided that we proved, we proved our point. Um, so um, with d dimension six, um, the size of x and y is pretty small, um, according to the bound, um, but it's still factored um, a huge number of keys, almost all of them. Um, and these are various other parameters. Um, so we factored 11 additional keys using all of this computation full time. This is when we decided that we were getting diminishing returns from this approach and that we should just stop because we proved our point. Um, so I guess some, some open questions here. Why did all these things work better in practice than the theory says that they do? Why did they work so much better in practice than the theory says that they do? Um, and um, what, what piece am I missing in finding solutions? That there was always a solution that we could find. Um, in almost every case, the, the equations were algebraically dependent, but we had this magical so small solution of one of the factors that the the, the algebraic dependency was a nice linear equation that happened to have a nice solution, but that somehow couldn't be solved by a, a smaller lattice. Something is going on here. Don't know what it is. Uh, so here's a diagram. I think if you if you write a paper with Dan Bernstein, you end up with a diagram like this in your paper. Um, so these are all of the different fun techniques that we threw at the database of keys. So there was the batch GCD. Um, algorithm which factored 103 keys. There was batch trial division which factored 121 keys. Total that um, extra um, speculative trial division, univariate coppersmith, bivariate coppersmith, and in the end we ended up with 183 secret keys belonging to four Taiwanese people. Um, so this still leaves the question what's going on with these smart cards? Um, the best practices, I mean, this is all from the first lecture, we know kind of how one should generate um, random numbers. Um, one should 
characterize the entropy source. You should test the entropy source at runtime and make sure that it passes some basic sanity checks on the um, outputs. And then you should also post-process the raw entropy source into a uniform entropy source. Um, and then you should have some kind of cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generator that you're actually passing it through to get some output. And um, FIPS compliance specifies all of these behaviors, which means that if the cards were generating keys that had primes that looked like the ones that we were seeing, they were very clearly not FIPS compliant. Um, so there was a set of hypothesized failures um, in two steps. First is that there is an underlying flaw in the hardware random number generator that was actually causing it to repeat um, patterns and say repeat long series of zeros. And the, and the underlying failure that we hypothesized is that um, these hardware random number generators often have some kind of oscillating circuit that needs to have some kind of random chaotic interaction with itself um, that should be outputting a sequence of bits. And in this case, it seems that there's a flaw that it can get stuck in a repeating cycle. Um, and then the second failure, which compounded this, was that the card software was not operating in FIPS mode. Um, so it had been turned off. Um, which meant that there was no t testing or post-processing of the raw outputs of the RNG, and they were just being fed straight into the um, prime number generator. So there were two sets of disclosures. The first was in June or in A uh, April 2012 about the first set of GCE keys, um, and the second one was in June 2013 about all of the lattice stuff. So in July 2012, the um, Taiwanese government replaced the cards for the vulnerable certificates that have been factored using the GCD algorithm. Um, and in July 2013, um, they told us that they planned to replace the entire full bad batch of cards, that there was one bad batch that had these properties, and they would replace it. Um, so I have a couple of emails. So this is an excerpt from an email to us that they said in August 2013 that they um, were experimenting with what we told them and that they were implementing the algorithm to check our work and that they would um, that they had revoked all of the problematic certificates and informed um, the affected card holders to replace the cards. <coughs> so. And then um, after a reporter wrote about our results. They released a press release in Chinese that said that they replaced all the vulnerable cards in July 2012. So, interesting times with people who are sending different messages. So here's some, I guess, conclusions of everything that I've talked about. Um, widely used crypto can fail in interesting ways that affect real world security. Interesting mathematically, interesting systems -y. Um, And as we've seen, entropy generation is a really hard problem um, that is screwed up over and over and over and over again in the real world. Um, and complex systems can experience cascading failures that make otherwise good cri crypto trivial to break through basic math tricks like we've been doing this whole time. And um, we've seen several examples of these failures that were not caught until we looked mathematically at the public keys, which were the only sort of visible output of the random number generation. So that's all I have, so thank you very much.